In this video, we will discuss about some other important topics. So let's start with the first topic of this video that is heart failure. So what is heart failure? It is inability of heart to meet oxygen demands of the body. So when heart is not able to meet the oxygen demands, we know that heart is a very important organ which circulates the purified blood in our body. So if it is not able to meet the oxygen demands, then it will be unable to pump the blood. So what is the etiology and pathophysiology? How the heart failure occur? And what is the process? Pump failure may be caused by cardiac abnormalities or conditions that place increased demand on the heart. For example, cardiac muscle disorder. So we know that due to the cardiac abnormality, if there is any you know, anatomical dysfunction, or physiological dysfunction in the heart, then there can be pump failure. That is ability of the blood to eject the blood out of the heart. And that pump failure can occur due to the cardiac muscle disorder. So we know that in the heart, there are some important muscles which will help in contraction and relaxation of the valve. So that muscle disorder can lead to the heart failure. Valvular defects. We know that in the heart, there are two types of valve. In right side, there is tricuspid valve. And in left side, there is bicuspid valve, which is also known as mitral valve. So when there is some defect in the valve, so this can lead to the prolapse with regurgitation, that is the blood flow will be reversed. There may be aortic stenosis. So there is an aortic valve in the left side of the heart. And if there is stenosis, that is narrowing of that valve, so blood will be not able to move further. It will be reversed back. Hypertension. So when blood pressure is increased more than the normal value, that can also lead to the heart failure. Coronary atherosclerosis. We have discussed this in the earlier video where there is the deposition of plaque in the wall of arteries. So that plaque can lead to obstruction and blockage and that will not make the uh, heart able to pump the blood forward. Hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism can also cause the heart failure due to the increased thyroid hormone levels. Obesity. So, obesity can be also a reason here. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. We will see later that how COPD can lead to the heart failure. But yes, when there is pulmonary disease, there will be, we know that the right side of the heart provide blood to the lungs. That is impure blood and lung help in purifying the blood. So, when they will be COPD, that is the lungs will have some problem. So the blood will be not able to move forward in the lungs and the blood will be reversed back or there will be a lot of pressure on the right side of the heart and circulatory overload. So when there is circulatory overload, in that case also, there can be heart failure. Now heart failure can be classified as diastolic, that is impaired ventricular filling. Diastolic means that when there is the ventricular filling, when the blood is filling in the heart or systolic. So heart failure can be systolic, which means there is impaired ventricular contraction. When the heart is pumping the blood out, so that contraction is called systole. And when there is default in the systolic contraction, that can be also a type. So there are two types. One is diastolic heart failure. Second is systolic heart failure. In diastolic heart failure, there will be impaired filling of the blood in the ventricles. And in systolic heart failure, there will be impaired ventricular contraction. And it is determined by obviously the ejection fraction. How much blood the heart is able to pump from the valves. So it depends upon the ejection fraction. Now moving on to the first type of heart failure that is right-sided heart failure so what is right-sided heart failure 
it is one of the type of heart failure right sided heart failure is also called right ventricular heart failure or right heart failure now here we have to understand that right side of heart pumps used blood from your body back to your lungs we will see from this diagram that this is our heart this is the right side of the heart and this is the left side of the heart what occurs here that the right side of heart the right heart will pump the blood into the lungs it takes the impure blood from the body from superior vena cava and then the blood travels in the right side of the heart and it is sent to the pulmonary arteries that is in the lungs for the purification of blood so we can see here that the blood from the body that is from our extremity and and all other body parts the blood will be coming from there into the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava from superior and inferior vena cava it will move into the right atrium then there is the tricuspid valve tricuspid valve will help in moving the blood in the right ventricle so from tri tricuspid valve the blood will move in the right ventricle and then there is a pulmonary valve and from pulmonary valve the blood will move into the pulmonary arteries and then into the lungs so the deoxygenated blood will be oxygenated in the lungs so this is how the right heart works so we can see here the right side of heart pumps used blood from your body back to your lungs where it refills with oxygen right sided heart failure means your heart's right ventricle is too weak to pump enough blood to the lungs so, so in right sided heart failure we will see that the right side of the heart will have some kind of problem and it will be not able to pump the blood into the lungs so the blood will be you know that will be collected in the heart in the right side of the heart so what occurs here that that when lungs is not taking up the blood so that blood will reverse into the right ventricle in the right atrium then in the superior and inferior vena cava and this will lead to increased pressure in the body parts the blood will build up in the veins in the vessels that carry blood from the ba body back to the heart so all the veins all the blood vessels will have pressure the blood will build there due to the blockage of the lungs ability to take the blood so this will build up the pressure in the veins so there will be increased pressure in the veins the pressure pushes fluid out of your veins and into the other tissues so what occur here when there is lot of pressure on the arteries and veins so this will push the fluid from the arteries into the tissue so the blood will move from into the extracellular spaces so how the symptoms will appear the fluid builds up in your legs in your abdomen and in other areas of your body causing swelling so we i hope that you understood here that when blood is not able to move into the lungs so it will start reversing back into the body and that pressure in the blood of the body will lead to the swelling now let's see left side heart failure similar to right side heart failure left side is this side this is a left atrium this is a left ventricle and this is the bicuspid valve that is mitral valve and the left side of heart takes the blood from the pulmonary veins now we have to understand here that from right ventricle the blood went to the pulmonary arteries then it got oxygenated and it moved into the pulmonary veins and then into the left atrium so we have to understand here that from body 
the impure blood is going into the right side of the heart then right side is helping the blood to move into the lungs so that it purifies so lung is purifying that blood and it is sending that purified blood into the left side of the heart so it means that the left side of heart carries the blood from the pulmonary veins and that blood moves into the right uh, left atrium through mitral valve it move into the left ventricle and then into the aortic valve and from aortic valve it moves into the aorta which means that it helps in processing the blood into the body so we can see here that right side is taking impure blood from the body and left side of the heart is giving pure blood into the body so these are the two things that impure blood moves into the right side for getting purified and then from left side it gets back into the body that is purified blood so this is the process so what will happen then when they will be left side heart failure so when they will be left side heart failure the left side of your heart pumps fresh blood into the rest of your body through the circulatory system the left ventricle is a larger and stronger than right ventricle we have to remember here that left ventricle is more stronger than the right ventricle because it has to pump blood through whole body so we have to understand here that right ventricle is pumping blood into the lungs it don't need such amount of force a big amount of force but left ventricle is pumping the blood into the whole body so it is larger and stronger when people have left sided heart failure their hearts left side has to work harder to pump the same amount of blood left sided heart failure is the most common cause of right sided heart failure so when they will be left sided heart failure so blood will be not able to pump into the body and that will further lead to the right sided heart failure so we have understood understood by this diagram that how the blood is circulating in the heart and how it is supplying and what will occur when there will be some default in the pumping or the other things now moving on to the clinical findings so what we are going to observe in the patient having the heart failure so talking about the left ventricular heart failure what will occur when patient will have left ventricular heart failure it means that there is some problem in the left side of heart it means that blood will be not able to move into the body that is the purified blood so subjective data subjective data the patient will complain dyspnea from fluid within the lungs so what is occurring here we know that blood will be moving into the body we know that okay but when there is some problem in the left side of the heart so blood will be not able to move into the body so blood will be reversed back and this will move back into the pulmonary veins it means that it will develop pressure it will develop the fluid it will build the fluid in the lungs so patient will show the pulmonary symptoms the respiratory symptoms patient will show so we have to understand here that patient will have a build up of fluid in the lungs because the blood is not processing further into the body there is some problem in the left side of the heart so patient will complain dyspnea from fluid within lungs or thopnea fatigue restlessness paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea so it means that patient will have complaints like in orthopnea when patient will be lying they may be recumbent position when patient will be lying in recumbent position so patient will feel shortness of breath that is orthopnea and in paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea patient will have shortness of breath while sleeping due to the lying position so when patient will be sitting in the upright position then that shortness of breath or dyspnea will be relieved so basically the 
symptoms that will be associated with the respiratory system will be appearing. In objective data, that is what we will find in the patient. So we will see patient will have decreased oxygen saturation, crackle sound in the lungs, peripheral cyanosis because blood is not able to pump in the body. So the extremities will turn blue due to the lack of enough oxygenated blood. Kind stoke respirations. In kind stoke respiration, patient will have a period of. So basically what will occur that patient will have a period of fast breathing. Okay, patient will breathe fastly and shallow followed by slow and heavy breathing without any break. So there will be no break. Patient will suddenly start breathing very fast and very shallow breaths and then very slow and heavy breath. And there will be no, you know, pause between them. There will be no apnea between them. So this is kind stroke respirations. Patient will have frothy, blooding sputum, okay, dry, non-productive cough, decreased ejection fraction, dyspnea, decreased urine output because there is a lack of fluid in the body. So this will lead to the decreased urine output. S3, S4 summation gallop. So the hard sounds will appear. That is S3, S4 summation gallop. So all these clinical findings we will see in the patient. In right ventricle failure. So here the blood is not able to move into the lungs. And that is developing. The blood is developing in the body. It is not able to move forward. So the patient will have all the systematic symptoms that is system uh, the symptom related to the uh, that is all the body so in subjective data the patient will complain abdominal pain because fluid fluid is developing in the body okay so what is occurring here that fluid is developing in the body so there will be swelling and due to the fluid development. So patient will report abdominal pain, fatigue, bloating and nausea. And in objective finding, we will see jugular vein distension. So as we know that blood is not able to move forward in the lungs, so it will start moving backward. It will build up in the systematic system. So the all body parts will have some amount of swelling. So there will be jugular vein distension, dependent Pitting edema that often subsides at night when legs are elevated. So due to the development of fluid, the buildup of fluid, there will be edema and that will be pitting edema. And when the legs will be elevated, it means that patient will help himself in circulating the blood back into the heart. Okay, so pooling of blood will be prevented when patient will be elevating the legs. So this will help in relieving the edema. Ankle edema is frequently the first sign of heart failure. We have to remember here that ankle edema is a frequently the first sign of heart failure. Ascites, that is, the fluid will develop in the abdomen. From increased hydrostatic pressure within portal system, hepatomegaly, that is, liver size will get big, anorexia, respiratory distress, Example, use of accessory muscles for respirations, increased central venous pressure, diminished urine output. So all the systematic symptoms will be appearing in the client. So this is about the right ventricle failure clinical findings. Now moving on to the diagnostic tests. So what are the tests that will be performed on the patient to confirm the heart failure? So first of all, there is a hormone B type natriuretic peptide that is known as BNP. It rises in the patient having heart failure. The normal value is less than 100 picogram per ml. This is the normal value. But patient having heart failure, the BNP will be increased. And if it is from 100 to 300, then this is stage one heart failure. If it is between 300 to 600, then this is stage 2. And if it goes up the 600 picogram per ml, then this is a stage 3 of heart failure. So it has the degrees. So BNP will be rising, is rising in these patients. 
so what is bmp it is produced by the myocardium in response to increased ventricular and diastolic pressure so when the ability of the heart to fill up the blood that diastolic pressure when will increase in the ventricular end so th this increase in the pressure of the diastolic ventricular end will cause the bnp increase functions to promote diuresis bnp helps in promoting diuresis and vasodilation which reduces cardiac workload so this is the functions of the bnp so when it will increase it will indicate the heart failure second test that we can do is echocardiogram echocardiogram will help in assessing the ventricular function if the ventricles are performing well if they are able to fill up the you know the amount of blood is required and if the valves are functioning well all this thing we will know from the ecg and hypertrophy can be seen hemodynamic monitoring so we have to always monitor the patient for hemodynamic stability we have to see that if patient is having enough blood in the body if patient is not going in the cardiogenic shock other tests we can do is we can perform all the tests related to the electrolyte functioning hematocrit hemoglobin bun that is blood urea nitrogen creatinine complete blood count thyroid stimulating hormone ecg so all these tests are done to identify the underlying cause so we want to know that what is the actual cause of the heart failure is it due to the hyperthyroidism it is due to the other any physiological defects so to know all these things we have to perform all these tests now what is the management what is the therapeutic interventions that we will provide to the patient first of all we will tell the patient to rest in high fowler or orthopnic position to reduce the cardiac workload here we know that patient is having heart failure so we have to reduce the workload on the heart we have to improve the circulation all over the body so high fowler position or orthopnic position is best for the patient morphine can be given to reduce the anxiety and dyspnea third is oxygen therapy so oxygen therapy is required when there is not there is a lot of heart failure and there is no ability to provide the oxygenated blood to the heart in that case endotracheal intubation that is et tube insertion will be done and a ventilator for the acute ventricular failure decrease cardiac workload with diuretics vasodilators ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and nasiretide that is natricog. All these drugs will reduce the cardiac workload. Diuretic will help in promoting the uh, that is fluid output will be increased. So this will help in the reducing swelling. Vasodilator will help in reducing the pressure in the blood vessels. ACE and ARB are the anti-hypertensive drugs that we have discussed in the earlier video. Beta blocker is also an anti-hypertensive drug. And all these drugs will be given to reduce the cardiac workload. Next thing we can do is increase pump performance with digitalis. So digoxin or dobutamine can be given to increase the performance of the heart. That is pumping of the heart. Other things, other med management that we can do is potassium supplements. So potassium supplement to prevent digitalic toxicity. When patient is on digoxin drug, there is a major side effects of hypokalemia. So therefore, we have to provide potassium supplement. Hemodynamic monitoring through a multilumal pulmonary artery catheter to see the cardiogenic shock. Sodium restricted diet to limit fluid retention and promote fluid excretion. Paracentesis. So paracentesis will be done if ascites exists and is causing the respiratory distress. So in paracentesis, a catheter is inserted to remove the excess built-up fluid in the abdomen. So this will help in decreasing the respiratory distress if it is occurring. Cardiac resynchronization therapy. 
So use of right and left ventricular pacemaker leads to synchronized contractions and improve cardiac out output. So if there is any defect in the valve, if, if the blood is not able to pump enough blood due to defect in valve and there is no synchrony between the systole, diastole, then cardiac re-synchronization should be done so that there is synchrony in the contractions and the cardiac output is improved. So that's why this therapy is done. Now moving on to the nursing care of clients with heart failure. So what is the care required in the clients having heart failure? So first is the assessment. What we are going to assess and analyze in the patient. First of all, we have to take the vital signs. If there's increased, high, uh, increased blood pressure, we have to see. Pulse we have to check and other things. Breath sounds because it can be right-sided heart failure, it can be left-sided heart failure. So we, to, we have to see the S3, S4 sounds, the sound of crackles in the uh, lungs and in the heart, we will see the S3, S4 sounds. Oxygen saturation. So it is very important to check if there is enough oxygen in the blood. Second thing, we have to check the daily weight because patient will develop ascites, patient will develop the edema. So, we have to check the extent of pitting edema. Therefore, daily weighing is very important. Circumference of edematous extremity, we have to check. Abdominal girth, we should measure to see the ascites. Jiggler vein distension should be checked to see the development of fluid in the veins. Next is we will assess the hemodynamic status. We will check if patient is not going into shock, if patient is stable, if patient's blood level is enough in the body. Other thing is electrolyte levels. We have to check if patient have high sodium level or not, chloride is enough or not, or patient is not going to hypokalemia. All these things we have to see. And intake output should be monitored because patient is having ascites. So there is possibility that patient will have less output then after assessing all these things second thing we will plan what we will be giving for the care so first is we will advise the patient to attain high faller or orthopnic positions and we will supplement we will administer the supplementary oxygen so it all depends upon the clinical symptoms of the patient so but here the Position of high follower is mandatory to decrease the cardiac workload. Second thing is we have to tell the patient to elevate the extremity because elevating the extremity will help in reducing the pooling of blood and you know returning of the blood into the heart. Except when in acute distress. So if patient is in acute distress, in that case, this is very, very important. If patient is in acute distress, it means that there's increased workload in the on the heart. So in that case, if we tell the patient to elevate the extremity, so blood will start returning in the heart and the workload will increase more and more. That's why in acute distress, the elevation is not required. But in other cases, elevation of extremity will help in a good circulation of blood. Then we will continuously monitor the vital signs, the breath sounds, jugular with distension and saturation of oxygen. We will tell the patient to change positions slowly and frequently so that the pooling of blood does not occur. We will monitor the intake and output, daily weight of the patient and electrolytes. We will restrict the fluids as ordered because patient may develop ascites. We will provide small and frequent meals that will be low in sodium. So that will help in proper digestion of fluid, uh, food because we want that food should be properly digested and for that it should be given into the small and frequent meals so that blood circulation can be less there. We know that when patient take heavy meals, so what occur that all the blood circulation focus on the abdomen in the digesting that food. So therefore, to prevent that, to, to prevent all the focus of the blood circulation in digesting that food, we have to provide small and frequent meals. Also, as patient will have on the invasive lines, so we have to monitor those invasive lines. 
we have to administer the medications as prescribed for example cardiac glycosides antihypertensives diuretics phosphodiesterase inhibitors will help to establish the balanced schedule of the rest and activity there should be a balanced schedule between the rest and activity lifestyle modifications for example weight control smoking cessation we have to teach the importance of continued health care provided supervision so we have to tell that why it is very important to have your supervision of the heart failure that should be continuous we have to tell the importance in evaluation and outcome, we are expecting that patient will maintain adequate tissue perfusion. Patient uh, reduces peripheral edema. Patient adheres to the pharmacological and dietary regimen. So this was all about the heart failure where we have seen that what is the heart failure and what are the classification right-sided and left-sided heart failure, then the uh, clinical findings of the patient, then the diagnostic test, the medical management, the nursing care that is required for the patient. Now, moving on to the next topic that is vascular disease. The disorder, the disease that is related to the blood circulation in the body. So, this includes thrombophlebitis, varicose vein and peripheral vascular disease. So, all these are included in the vascular disease. First of all, we have to see what is the thrombus. The thrombus is a clot composed of platelets, fibrin, clotting factors and cellular debris attached to the interior wall of an artery or vein. So we can say it is a clogged blood which is composed of platelets, fibrin, clotting factors, cellular debris and it is attached on the artery wall or the vein wall so it will be attached on the wall of the vein or artery that will interrupt the blood flow that will narrow the blood flow what is embolus embolus is a clot or a solid particle carried by bloodstream may interfere with tissue perfusion in an artery or vein so embolus can be a solid particle and it is not only the platelet fibrin clotting factors. It can be other solid particle which is moving and it is carried by the bloodstream. It is moving in the bloodstream and it will interfere with the tissue perfusion in an artery or vein. Now, what are the arterial disorders? So, arterial disorders involve depriving oxygen to a body part or a tissue. So, an arterial disorder, what will occur that there will be no enough oxygen in the body part or tissue. It is affected by the BP and collateral circulation. So, it depends. It is, uh, you know, affected. It is affected by the blood pressure and the collateral circulation. So, what is collateral circulation here? It is an alternate or backup in the blood vessels in the body that can take over when another artery or veins become blocked or damaged. So, when we, there will be a damage in the vein or artery, so they, this is the backup for the blood circulation. So this is collateral circulation. Reduced blood flow resulting from atherosclerosis, thrombus or embolus. So arterial disorders can be due to reduced blood flow. First is reduced blood flow. When blood flow is reduced due to the atherosclerosis, any thrombus or embolus. So that Reduction in blood flow will lead to the arterial disorders. Second is lower extremity arterial disease. So this is atherosclerosis leads to the blockage of blood supply to the lower legs and feet. So what will occur when there will be a thrombus or emboli? So lead will occur that is lower extremity arterial disease. So arterial disorder can be due to reduced blood flow. LEAD and third is Burger's disease. So what is Burger disease? It is also known as thromboangitis obliterans. It is a very important disorder that we have to see here. So here, peripheral circulation impaired by inflammatory occlusions of the peripheral arteries. So what will occur here that there will be inflammation and due to that inflammation, there will be occlusion of the peripheral arteries. 
thrombosis of arteries may occur so that inflammation of the arteries will lead to the thrombosis formation and the blockage of the blood to move further incidence is highest in young adult males who smoke so the people who smoke are at a high risk in developing burgers disease next is renault's disease so what is renault's disease it is a spasm of digital digital arteries that is the fingers of the hand and feet so this is a spasm of the digital arteries thought to be caused by abnormal response of the sympathetic nervous system to cold or emotional stress so here the stressor is the cold or the emotional stress so when whenever a patient will be in the cold environment or having stress so they will be the spasm of the digital arteries it is usually bilateral primarily occurs in young females and continues throughout the life renaud's phenomena is episodic arterial spasm of extremity secondary to the another disease or abnormality so patient may be already having some heart problem and but when there will be a triggering stimulus that is cold environment in that case there will be spasm in the artery so this is the renaud's disease so there is a major difference between renaud's disease and the burger disease they in renaud's disease there is a spasm of arteries and in burger disease there is a inflammatory occlusion of the peripheral arteries another is venous disorders so this was about the arterial disorder that is burger disease renaud disease lead in venous disorder it interferes with the transportation of blood back to the heart from the capillary bloods pathophysiological changes may be include impaired smooth muscles around the vessels lack of muscular contraction damage to intima incompetent valves risk factors include immobility venous stasis vessel trauma oral contraceptive use pregnancy obesity and pelvic surgery so what will happen in venous disorder that the blood will be not able to transport into the heart there will be interference in that and that interference can be due to the impaired smooth muscles in the vessels abnormal muscular contractions incompetent valves and the risk factors are all these things what is thrombophlebitis thrombophlebitis is the inflammation of vein what is deep vein thrombosis it is the thrombophlebitis associated with the clot formation so when in the deep veins of the extremities there is thrombophlebitis there is a inflammation of vein this is deep vein thrombosis venous thromboembolism so dvt associated with the pulmonary embolism so as the name indicates venous that is the inflammation of the vein and thromboembolism that that is there will be the emboli formation in the pulmonary area next is varicose vein what is varicose vein it occurs when vein in the lower extremities become dilated and congested which increases the hydrostatic pressure and torturous as a results of weakness of valves or loss of elasticity of the vessel walls so what will occur that in the lower extremity there will be the dilation of the vein and these vein will be very congested so it will appear like a very the vein will appear very prominent in the legs this can be due to the loss of elasticity of vessel this can be due to the weakness of valves risk factors involve family history prolonged standing pregnancy leg trauma and thrombophlebitis so if patient stand, has a standing job so this can lead to the venous pooling that is the blood will pool in the lower extremity there will be no circulation no no returning of the blood into the heart and this will lead to the varicose vein clinical findings so in peripheral arterial disorders what will be the clinical findings so patient will complain paresthesia aching to severe or burning pain lower extremity pain with exercise that is intermittent claudication so when the patient will do exercise there will be a lack of oxygen in the extremities and this will lead to the pain in the extremity that is known as intermittent claudication this is very important in objective findings we will see pallor or dependent rubor shiny color skin 
so due to the lack of oxygen due to the lack of blood circulation patient's skin will appear shiny cool there will be hair loss because there will be no enough circulation for the hairs thickened nails gangrenous ulcers of toes or heel diminish or absent pulses and decrease ankle brachial index so we can see here, here that there is a impaired circulation and that impaired circulation has lead to the poor healing there is a poor healing healing is very poor there is hair loss at that area pulse is absent there diminished there and ankle brachial index is decreased now what is the ankle brachial index in ankle brachial index we compare the blood pressure between the ankle and the brachial artery the artery of the arm so if the blood pressure is low in the ankle it means that there is some circulatory disorder in the body because ankle uh, you know blood pressure should be higher than the brachial pressure but if it is lower then it indicates that there is some that is there is some uh, circulatory dysfunctioning so a low ankle brachial index number can indicate narrowing or blockage of the arteries in the legs okay so this is done to see the blockage in the arteries what we will find in the patient having thrombophlebitis or dvt so if patient have inflamed vein if patient has uh, you know deep vein thrombosis so what the clinical findings the patient will report so in subjective data patient may be asymptomatic until embolus is released and occludes the organ calf pain on proximal of ankle that is homan sign so as we will tell the patient to dorsiflex the ankle there will be calf pain but it is not a reliable indicator this sign should not be elicited because dorsiflexion may dislodge the thrombus so sometimes there may be a thrombus but when we tell the patient to dorsiflex the leg to bend the leg so this may dislodge and it can go into the lungs so it should be not elicited so these are the subjective data in objective data we will find edema of one leg redness and warmth of area along the vein doppler studies of lower extremity indicate obstruction or decreased flow from that area suggesting thrombus formation positive d dimer assay will be there which indicates produces of fibrin degradation in the blood normal value is 250 mcg so positive d dimer is a test that is done to see that if there is a fibrin degradation in the blood to see if there is a thrombus formation so this can be also done here in the varicose vein the patient will complain heaviness and fatigue in the legs with cramping it usually relieve when legs are elevated so it can occur due to prolonged standing so it will be relieved when the legs are elevated and circulation is returned in objective finding there will be positive venogram positive trendelberg test in diagnostic of varicose vein brown skin discoloration from breakdown of hemoglobin and deposition of ferrous sulfate edema stasis ulcers usually develop around ankles and calf from the venous insufficiency so when there is a varicose vein there will be brownish discoloration of the skin in trendelberg test there will be it will be positive we will see that it is positive remember that there is a difference between prendelberg and frendelenburg test prendelenburg test is for varicose vein in this we tell the patient to lie down in the supine position with legs elevated one leg will be elevated above the heart level then when there is a returning of the blood back in the heart then we will apply tourniquet on the upper thigh and then we will tell the patient to stand now here there is tourniquet applied on the upper thigh so we will see if the there is a return of the blood into the legs so here we want to check that if blood is moving back into the lower part of the legs or not so we want to check if there is any thrombus or emboli that is 
interrupting the blood flow into the lower extremity so we will apply the tourniquet normally the superficial saphenous vein will fill between 30 to 35 second so in 30 to 35 second the blood flow will return into the capillary blades reaching the vein the release of compression does not result in rapid filling from above indicating competence of valves in blow both deep and superficial vein so if there is a proper blood flow in the legs uh, so it indicates that there is a proper blood flow and there is no abnormality so this is trendel work test and there will be brown discoloration because hemoglobin will break down due to no enough oxygen and there will be deposition of ferrous sulfate after the hemoglobin breakdown so brown skin will appear now moving on to the therapeutic interventions so what are the management for the patient so a patient having peripheral vascular disease arterial vasodilators and antiplatelet agents will be given to break down the thrombus and emboli and vasodilator will be given sympathectomy can be done to severe sympathetic ganglia supplying the area there is a local vasodilation with improved circulation bypass grafting can be done if there is some damage to the artery so bypass is done so that circulation is intact amputation can be done if vascular supply is severely impaired so if there is a severe impairment in the circulation so amputation of that part can be done in varicose vein sclerotherapy can be done that is injection of a chemical irritant into the vein surgical interventions ligation of the vein above the varicosity so there can be the ligation of the vein where the varicose vein has appeared and removal of the involved vein so we will ligate the vein then we will remove the affected vein and then we will make the anastomosis the great saphenous vein may be ligated near the femoral junction deep veins must be able to accommodate venous flow early embolization to prevent formation of thrombi so all these things we have to remember in thrombophlebitis prophylactic interventions anti embolism stockings will be given and exercise will be advised to promote venous return moist heat to promote vasodilation elevation of extremity to reduce edema anticoagulants will be given to prevent the recurrence of the thrombi vasodilators will be given to prevent vascular spasm thrombolytic therapy to dissolve the clot and transvenous filter or thrombectomy will be done in nursing care of the client with vascular disease first thing we have to assess the risk factor that is smoking and if patient is having any heart disease and the clinical findings of the patient then affected extremity will be checked for the pulse the color temperature circumference doppler scan will be done to see the attainment of peripheral pulse mobility will be checked in the extremity in planning we will observe the sign of vascular impairment that is paler cyanosis coolness of involved extremities and amplitude and symmetry of the peripheral pulse we have to check that if there is symmetry in the peripheral pulse as compared to the normal pulse and we will check the skin for the discoloration or hair fall other things we have to instruct the client to avoid cigarette smoking because nicotine constricts vessels or massaging legs because this can dislodge the thrombus maintaining one position for long period should be avoided and wearing tight clothing will be avoided because that can affect the peripheral vessel reduce weight when indicated control diabetes hypertension and lipid levels maintain adequate hydration perform ankle exercise so muscle contractions prevent venous stasis so mainly we want to improve the circulation so all things will be done to improve the circulation venous insufficiency so for venous insufficiency we will have to tell the patient to elevate legs to limit edema apply anti embolism stockings before arising applying sequential compression device for clients on prescribed bed rest so sequential compression device will help in moving it will if patient is bed ridden so it will move the it will make the blood move in the uh, vessels so it will prevent the thrombus formation so sequential compression device is very important if thrombophlebitis is suspected maintain bed rest and notify healthcare provider in arterial insufficiency keep extremities warm instruct to wear gloves when exposed to cold and apply lubricants to keep skin supply maintain dependent position of extremity to increase arterial flow and limit pain so in venous insufficiency and in arterial insufficiency 
various management will be done as per the requirement. We have to observe the clinical manifestation of thrombophlebitis and pulmonary embolism because if patients have sudden chest pain, that it means that there is the dislodge of the thrombus into the lungs. And this can lead to chest pain, sinuses, blood in the sputum, shock can be there. Maintain client on bed rest and notify the healthcare provider if thrombophlebitis or pulmonary embolism is suspected. Provide specific care if undergoing vascular surgery. So if patients on vascular surgery, so we have to monitor the client for hemorrhage. We have to notify the healthcare provider if bleeding is suspected. We have to assess the neurovascular status. We have to keep the extremity elevated in immediate post-operative period. And we have to allow out of the bed as per the order. Then we have to provide specific care after vein ligation. We have to elevate the food of the, from the bed for first 24 hours and observe for the signs of hemorrhage, maintain compression dressings, assist with ambulation. We have to provide a specific care after end arterectomy. So if patient has been done end arterectomy and bypass grafting, so we have to provide specific care according to that. We have to assess the circulation of the involved area by checking pulse. We have to all things we have to do all things to check the circulation so assess pulse assess the capillary refill time color temperature mobility and sensory function monitor blood pressure because hypotension increase possibility of thrombus formation encourage hydration and maintain blood volume and decrease viscosity observe for the signs of hemorrhage and pain changes in skin color alteration of vital signs ambulate as ordered sitting should be avoided because this can lead to the venous pooling Administer prescribed medications. In evaluation, we are expecting that tissue perfusion is maintained and patient has verbalizes reduction in pain. So this was all about this video. I hope that you understood about the vascular diseases. In this, we have included thrombophlebitis, varicose vein. And I hope that you have watched this video till the end. And keep watching the other videos and keep learning new things. We will meet in the next video. Thank you.